de la Cruz. As we ponder the great virtue of humility today in the readings, uh, you know, the first reading, if you're the, the more authority that you have, the more you have to be uh, look for those opportunities to be humble, to be little. Um, and so how do we understand this virtue of humility? It's not the greatest virtue. Right? Charity is the greatest. Right? Love. God is love. However, humility is the basic foundation for any other virtue, though. You can't grow in any other virtue if you don't have humility. Why? Well, that means you're proud. The opposite of humility is pride. And pride blinds me to be able to see how I can grow right? and to be able to love, ultimately. Uh, so humility comes from the root word for earth, hummus, and it's that opportunity that God gives to us every day right, um, to see, you know, in ways that how I can go about my life, my vocation, with my gifts and talents that he has given to me, okay, uh, using them for his greater honor and glory and loving my neighbor as myself, but then always realizing that it all goes back to him. Right? That, that's actually true humility. False humility is to think, well, I can't do anything good, and I'm just going to sit off in the corner. And actually, God condemns such an individual, doesn't he? The three different individuals, their Lord, and he tells that parable. They're given talents. The first two double them. Third buries his. He's condemned for it. Because right? he didn't use the talents God gave him. So every one of us has gifts and talents that God gives to me. That's why jealousy or envy is I'm missing my opportunity to focus on the talents God's given me and be grateful for them right, and perfect them. Right? So it's, it's good to have this, this proper understanding. So humility actually frees me to be able to, to see how I can, you know, love God and love my neighbor and actually truly be a human person, be the true human person our Lord has called me to be. So it's not a belittling of myself at all, but it's actually recognizing, though, that, okay, before God, who am I? So I don't look for honors. I don't need, I don't need to look for the first place. Uh, I don't need to blow a horn. don't need to let people know what I've been doing. Um, actually, if that happens, it happens, but it all, it all goes back to God, right? right? So there are some key ways, some helpful ways of growing in humility so we can grow in all the other virtues, uh, so we can be perfect and, and have peace and joy. Um, and two of them just, just offered uh, as possibilities here. One is the litany of humility. If you've ever prayed it, it's very powerful, very direct. Okay. Um, it was the one that Cardinal Mary Duvall, um, if he didn't write it himself, he, he fostered it. He was the secretary to Pope St. Pius X, who was the Pope, 1903 and 1914. Mary Duvall was just incredible, um, uh, Cardinal. And the litany of humility, like, um, you know, to, uh, that others may be chosen and I set aside, that others may be praised and I unnoticed, that in the opinion of the world others may increase and I may decrease, uh, from the fear of failure, um, from the fear of being rejected and ignored, from the fear of, um, you know, of being forgotten, uh, calumniated, slandered, uh, from the desire of being praised, referred to others, desire of being um, accepted and approved by others, the list goes on. It's a very beautiful litany, um, but one that helps with an examination of conscience every day uh, for you know, rectitude of intention. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Because okay? if I'm doing it for the things of this world, for honors or what other people think, that's really, then I'm going to be dictated to by others, aren't I? I really don't have much of a foundation. I don't have much of a rudder at all. Just the wind's going to blow me wherever, it, the winds of, of public opinion. But when I have humility, oh, okay. Well, whatever, that stuff can come and go. My focus is on our Lord, okay? There's a second um, uh, way of spiritually, um, a spiritual devotion of growing in humility. It's called the 17 Evidences of Lack of Humility. This is even more direct, uh, written by, I believe, St. Jose Maria Escriva, founder of Opus Dei, great saint. When, and some of the phrases are, well, to give my opinion when I'm not asked, to think that my opinion matters, okay? Um, to use the word I, okay, in conversation, to draw conversation back to myself, to use myself as an example. These are some of the, it's, you start looking at it, it's like, oh my goodness, right? And then it kind of changes your, your, your thought process and, and basically kind of helps, okay, this is how our, our Lady, St. Joseph, our Lord, this is how they were. And it, what it does is, again, it, it takes away these restrictions 
so that I can see our Lord more readily in, in everything that I do each day, whether you know, inconveniences, you know, uh, imperfections of others. Okay, I tend to be more patient, tend to be more generous, more grateful. Okay, um, you know, the list goes on. But it also helps when I'm, you know, before our Lord too, when it comes to my prayer life, you know, it comes to especially, you know, being able to recognize just the gifts of our Lord. So the second reading, the book, letter to the Hebrews, and just it's good for us not to miss this. Uh, this is the 12th chapter of Hebrews. It talks about how, and this is, this is pretty much the New Testament book on the priesthood. But he, what does he say? You have approached Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and countless angels in festival gathering. Where do we find that phraseology? Mount Zion, the New Jerusalem. Well, the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, beautiful as a bride adorned to meet her husband. That's from the book of Revelation. It's throughout, the, it's throughout it. But where does that happen? The book of Revelation doesn't say where that happens, where the New Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. It's this book that says where it happens. On Mount Zion. In the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. What happened on Mount Zion? It's the upper room where our Lord gave us the Eucharist, the Last Supper, okay, where he began his passion and death to redeem the world. Okay. It's the Mass. At every Mass, heaven comes down upon this altar. Okay. Heaven on earth. Okay. And if we look at the book of Revelation this way, and you read the book of, uh, written by you know, a great a convert to the faith, Scott Hahn, the Lamb's Supper, it, it's, he, just, he just shows us so clearly. The book of Revelation is about the Mass here on earth, but going on in heaven. Okay. And you see, we see these, um, these connections. Um, so it's, it's, it's the wedding feast of the Lamb, and the church is his bride. Um, but it's the Lamb as if he were slain, there in the book of Revelation, before the throne of the Father. So at every Mass, what is going on? It's not between you and me, right? It's actually, this is going on in heaven, regardless of us. This is the sacrifice of Christ, perpetually, eternally in heaven, before the Father. If you notice in the prayers of the Mass, almost all of them are addressed to whom? God the Father. Okay? So if you ever come to daily Mass, we're all facing the same way. You know, I, I, I kind of struggle with this, uh, and many priests do at times, the, that in the 70s, when the, when, the, when the ordinary form of Mass was given to us by St. Paul VI, it wasn't said that the priest was going to fa be facing the people. Those of you who grow, who've been Remember back, remember, okay, you're always facing the same way as the people. So when, you know, the priest is actually the one in the person of Christ going to the Father, taking the sacrifice as in the Old Testament, taking the sacrifice of the people to God. Well, okay, in this case, it's the priest in the person of Jesus. All the prayers are being spoken to God, the Father. And so the symmetry of when the priest is facing east, the direction of the resurrection, and the sun coming up from the rising from the dead, so to speak, light conquering darkness. When that's the case, we're all, it's very, the symbolism is very rich, okay? Um, and it's this understanding that this is the sacrifice of Christ, the heavenly Jerusalem coming down upon heaven, the wedding feast of the Lamb, and our being offered to God the Father. In every prayer, most, almost all the prayers, so you get to write before Holy Communion when they're addressed right directly to Jesus. But even right before Holy Communion, what do we say? Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Well, where is that? That's the book of Revelation. That's the wedding feast in heaven. This is what's going on in heaven. So humility, again, helps us. What, sin blinds us. And humility is a recognition of, well, before Almighty God, my littleness, that, you know, if, to be able to recognize, okay, Sin, get to confession, have it wiped away, but then I'm able to see and embrace more uh, these truths of, of, of the faith. You can recognize in a, a deeper spiritual way what's going on, especially at Mass, huh? All right. May Almighty God bless you through the Immaculate Heart of Mary.